Hi, this is Gloria, your life coach. Welcome to another episode of Life's a Shuffle. Hi, this is Ron Johnson, your life coach, leadership coach, motivation speaker, and health coach. And welcome to another, another episode of Life's a Shuffle. And today we have an amazing guest. And I can't wait to hear her story. And I can't wait to talk to her. Joy Soto, introduce yourself, tell us who you are, because everybody likes to hear who you are. Hi, my name is Joy Soto, and I am a documentary filmmaker. I've been a dolphin trainer. I've spoken at TEDx, um, and I'm a mom. <laughs> so I'm a lot of different things, but that's what I am. I'm also a cancer survivor. I had cancer when I was 25 years old. So um, there's a, a variety of things that I am. <laughs> <laughs> Would you say that you're the jack of all trades? Uh, a little bit, actually. Yeah, <laughs> I would say that. And you wear too many hats, too. <clears throat> yeah. Especially when you're a mom. <laughs> I you sure do. So, so tell us, so I was, I was looking at a YouTube video, and um, your, your journey about being a cancer survivor is a freaking amazing. That's what I got to say. Mm -hmm. Thank you. When you when you found out you had cancer, and when you found out um, you may or may not make it, I don't. I never had cancer, but I've known people that have had it, and it can go one way to the right, all the way to the left. You just don't know. What were the thoughts that going through your mind? What was happening? And and obviously, my second question being is, how are we going to beat this? Um, and Joy, before you answer this question, just out of curiosity, if you don't mind um, telling us um, what type of cancer. Sure. I So I was 25 years old and I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And if you're asking what I was thinking, I think I was thinking what anyone would think is, you know, why me? And uh, it just it was just like this unbelievable kind of sense that you have, like, okay, I've seen this happen to other people, but this isn't going to happen to me. But then it's happening to you and you're kind of going through it. So that was kind of my initial uh, thought is just kind of a time of shock and uh, trying to come to terms with what's happening. And then I can only imagine that was happening. Yeah, and at such such a young age, right at twenty five, and yeah, I mean, at that age, you still have so much things that you wanted to do in life. I bet you know what were you doing before that. Well, okay. So I was just, I feel like we have these paths in life and we, you know, sometimes we'll take, make a choice and go on a different path. Why well, I had been on this path of being a dolphin trainer and I had been, um, for a while. And so I decided to choose another path at this point because I, at home, what I was doing was I was always editing on the computer and making these videos and people would hire me to make videos. And I, all I could think about was that when I was at, at my dream job working with the dolphins. So I ended up leaving SeaWorld and I went to film school up at this place. It actually doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. It's called uh, Brooks Institute of Photography. And so I went there for film school. And uh, so that's what I was doing at that point. And, and it was maybe two months into my film school. Uh, it was on Thanksgiving, actually. I had been coughing for about two weeks and the cough was getting worse instead of better. And I went over to my uncle's house for Thanksgiving and I remember walking in the door and coughing. And then for the first time in all the time that I've been coughing, I put my hand on my throat. And when I did that for the first time, I felt a lump there. And I remember just all the blood draining from my face. And I just went straight to the bathroom to check out what was there. And sure enough, there, it, it looked like a little egg underneath my skin right there. Oh. And I couldn't understand how it had just popped up and what it was. And I, you know, uh, interrogated my family, like, have you seen this? Did you see this when I walked in? Did you just come up or, and we didn't know. So, um, I, they ended up taking me to urgent care that night. And I'll never forget this doctor who sat there and pushed on the lump again and again. And he kept asking me if it hurt. And I kept saying no. And then he just kept asking me again and again. And I kept thinking, oh, he must think that I'm so strong. <laughs> he <laughs> must be really impressed with me because this doesn't hurt. Like, yeah. Yeah. I'm really strong. This is all what's happening in my head. And, but I can see that he's not happy. So as he walks away, I said, it's good if it doesn't hurt, right? And he didn't even look back at me. He just said, no, it's not always good if it doesn't hurt. And that's when I knew that something was really wrong. I actually asked him if it was leukemia because I just, in the waiting room, read an article on leukemia. And he just didn't say anything. He didn't answer me. So that was when it all happened. And before I knew it, I kind of 
I, how I felt was I felt like I fell off the face of the planet, you know, because I'd been going to film school. I had these people that I knew, and then I, I had to withdraw from everything. So that's kind of how things got started with me and cancer. <laughs> wow. Wow. You get ready to have Thanksgiving dinner, you get ready to enjoy friends and family, and you feel this uneasy feeling of a lump in your throat, which is not supposed to be there. Right. I can imagine the fears, the... Then when Dr. Pushman says, oh, I don't feel I feel fine, you think, okay, great. So if I don't have any feeling, no mm-hmm. pain, it should be fine, right? It's just anomaly. Maybe I got bit by a mosquito or something, right? right. You just don't know. Wow. Interesting journey. Well, I was listening to you right now and also listening to your uh, video. Out of curiosity, do you think this helped change your trajectory and your purpose in life? Oh, Absolutely. I, I really feel like when someone experiences something, and I, I, I wish we didn't have to experience these hardships in life, but uh, when you experience something like this, then you're left with that, right? Like I was exposed to this world of all these people who had cancer, not just people, but um, it, further into my journey, I was treated at a children's hospital. Uh, it was Children's Hospital Los Angeles. And the reason why was because we had a second opinion by a, a pediatric oncologist uh, who we knew, and he recommended a really aggressive therapy. And he was like, you know, like at the top of his field and all these things. And the reason why is because they've found that, and I don't know what it is now, but at that point they found that um, young adults are usually undertreated because young adults are treated um, with a chemotherapy protocol that goes from like 20 to 80, right? But kids are treated more aggressively. And so he wanted to hit me with a kid's protocol because he thought that I could handle it. And so um, I got to see all of these kids who were also battling cancer. And I have to say, if you ever feel bad for yourself, that drops away in an instant when you see a toddler walking down the hallway with, um, you know, an IV and learning how to walk. And and, and, and honestly, their spirits were just incredible. They were still joyful and playing and um, just, just like being as normal as they could be while they're battling cancer. So um, I think that really opened my eyes and... So I, I really think if I hadn't gone through that experience, then I wouldn't have done the things I've done in my life to help give back. Like I've started a program later on in my life where I went back to working with dolphins at SeaWorld and I started a program for kids from Children's Hospital at Radies and Children's Hospital Los Angeles. So Radies is the one in San Diego um, where they can come to the park and get in the water to meet a dolphin. So I would actually bring them in the water myself. And, uh, their faces would just light up and they would just, you know, have a day away and their parents were out there watching. And it was just these wonderful moments. And if I hadn't been touched by cancer, I would have never done that. So I I do think that, you know, these, these hardships that we go through in life, they help us to help other people later on. You know, that when you talked about the kids with cancer, it just reminded me of the time when, um, you've heard of Lucille Packard here at Stanford, right? And, um, in the Bay Area. Um, so Lucille Packard is a cancer um, hospital for kids is where they treat, um, you know, kids with cancer. And years ago, I had a friend who was, um, who had leukemia and he was battling cancer. And I remember going through to visit him, uh, going through that building where the kids are, but just, yeah. I did that just out of curiosity. I didn't have to, but I just thought I figured I just want to see how those kids, to me, like how they look like, because I've seen adults, you know, with, with cancer and how they go through it in the hospital, but just to see the kids. And it just, I just had this vision of, I saw like a couple of kids walking in the hallway, like what you just said, um, with their IV and they're just walking with a big smile on their, on their face with a stuffed toy, um, you know, shaved head, everything, but they had like so much joy, like just walking around. Yeah. Like they're not, they're not battling anything. They don't look weak. They look strong. And I remember walking through that hallway and watching all these kids and going through, you know, like just peeking through each doors and it just, it broke my heart. Um, I did have tears in my eyes because I felt like, wow, they're so young. They're little. I've even seen someone in a wheelchair, like maybe five years old. And I did that twice and ever since then I just remember I didn't want to go through that building anymore again because each time I do it just breaks my heart but like what you said you know um I like um how you did this for the kids with um with the organization that you put together 
And so with that, it looks like with you being treated in the children's hospital, that that kind of lift you, that lifted you up a little bit more and in a positive way. Yeah, I think it did. And I have to say that I was so grateful to be treated in children's hospital because I started out my treatment at a regular adult, you know, hospital. And then I moved to children's hospital for my third chemotherapy treatment. And when I did that, it was just, just a breath of fresh air to be there because, um, I mean, it, there was a lot of light there and there were these like big, colorful pieces of artwork and it was just, and then everyone was so nice and loving and helpful. It was just a very different experience. And so I'm very grateful I was there. And in fact, I felt more comfortable being there than I did at home. So, you know, if there was a chance for me to be in the hospital, I felt safe and just taken care of. So for me, it's, it was like a second home. So I, I... Uh, yeah, it was it was a very good experience for me, and I'm very grateful for that. How long was um, how long was your treatment? It was about six months, and my my diagnosis changed in between. That was part of the reason why my chemotherapy treatments changed. So at first, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is uh, what m- my doctor explained to me was basically it was a good kind of cancer. I don't remember if she said that. But it, that was basically it. It was um, you have a higher chance of surviving and the treatments um, not as intense as uh, the other kinds of cancer. And so that was what we were hoping for. We found out we had or I had it. I say we because it was a group of us going mm-hmm. through this with me. But I found out I had Hodgkin's lymphoma. And then I, it was right after my second chemotherapy, I got a call from the doctor and the doctor said, uh, for some reason, your slides were sent for, to Stanford and it looks like it's actually non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And so that was the point where, okay, things need to change. It needs to be more intense. So thank God that they got sent there. And I found out it was not my oncologist that sent them there. My first oncologist, it was um, my, my primary care doctor who just decided to send them to Stanford. I don't, I don't know how that worked out, but if he hadn't done that, I wouldn't be here right now because I would have been undertreated. So, you know, this world works in mysterious ways. I'm so grateful that that happened. So that, so it was after it became more aggressive, and that, that's when my treatment changed and I went to Children's Hospital. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, very interesting. Um, you know, first I'm going to say, I got to pick your brain one day because one of my biggest things is, so I grew up as an old weight child. So I just imagine this. I was about in sixth grade, so I don't know, 10, 11, 12, somewhere around there. I was 206 pounds. And just being overweight back then, especially in the 90s, you were just an oddball, right? You know, nowadays, you know, things have changed. People are taller, people are bigger. But back then, you were an oddball. And do you know what gynomastica is? Have you heard the term used before? No. Okay. So uh, the slang is, forgive my language, it's called bitch titch, which really means is that there's excess <laughs> breast tissue on a male. And that's because people know that as a slang. So it's excess breast tissue on the chest of a male patient okay. or person. And usually what happens, kids go through you know, puberty. So obviously you increase your testosterone. Sorry, your estrogen increases, so it creates breast tissue. So that's what happened to me as a kid is I had gyno. Yeah. And I didn't know why. And the kids used to be funny. He's pulled the shirt. So look, I had breasts. It was just horrible. And it's kind of obliterated my self-esteem. So my point is I'm going to open a foundation for underprivileged kids um, that um, – need help to transfer um, their bodies, transfer their, their minds, transfer their self-esteem. Because I really just appalled the fact that food prices are so scattered. You go to a place called Food Max. I don't think you have one where you, you live at. But here, you know, apples, let's say, is 89 cents a pound. You go to, let's say, Whole Foods, it's $2 a pound. Okay, why is that such a disparity in food? And why is that happening? Well, if you go to, let's say, Food Max, they have cereal 10 for 10. You go to Food um, Whole Foods, so it's like five bucks a, a box. So, so why do we have this disparity in a great country living? So, but that's here or there. Um, when I hear your story about battling cancer, I, was it the treatment that saved your life or your spirit, I meaning oh. attitude? Well, I mean, if I were to say it was my spirit, that would be um, crazy <laughs> because, <laughs> I mean, I went through massive doses of chemotherapy. So uh, I, to say, oh, it was just my spirit, uh, that, that's clearly not just it. I, I, it could have gone either way with me, but I have to say, I remember being, uh, in the very beginning of my treatment before I actually even had any chemotherapy, they were taking a bunch of blood samples. And I remember sitting there with a nurse and she was taking my blood sample and I, I don't know how it came up, but somehow I said that I had, I just been diagnosed with cancer. 
and I remember her pausing and looking at me and then looking back at the blood and saying, you'll be just fine. And I said, well, how do you know that? She said, because you're sitting here getting your blood drawn, you have cancer and you're smiling, you'll be just fine. And she said, I see people come in all the time who are already defeated before they even start. So I do think my attitude towards this whole thing helped me uh, that I, I did have a positive attitude. Um, but I mean, I, I cannot sit here and credit my positive attitude with surviving. But I, I think that it was, I think it was very important. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's I think it's partly what kept you alive and where you are today now with such a free spirited, you know, attitude and just just positive in a lot of things now. And, you know, when you were going through that, um, besides, you know, being a children's hospital and, and um, feeling, you know, just, just being around there and feeling, you know, there's light and, and the colorful hospital. Was there anything else that kept you, you know, positive in that sense of going through that? Yeah, I had people around me all the time. I, I What I found with cancer is that people do one of two things. They will either shut themselves off and they don't talk to anyone. And I think that happens a lot. Or there's people like me who let people know and then they get supported. So I had a ton of support, not only from my family, but from my friends. I mean, I've been working at SeaWorld and what do you do at SeaWorld? Those, those people take care of animals all of the time. So mm-hmm. I, the minute I told them, all of a sudden it was like an all points bulletin went out. The joy was sick and she needed people. <laughs> and it, I mean, it was crazy. I, I remember my talking to my friend on the phone, Christine, and she said, do you want me to tell anyone? I said, yeah, tell anyone who cares because if there's ever a time I need my friends, it's now. And with that, it went out. And and after that, there were they were organizing amongst themselves. Okay, do you have this weekend? I'm going to be up there next weekend. Oh, I can't go because I'm sick because I couldn't be around sick people. Um, so they had this whole organization. And then I had this person who I'd never met, but he worked at SeaWorld and he had just had the Hodgkin's lymphoma. And so he drove all the way up. I mean, these people were driving three or four wow. hours up to see me, um, whether it was just for a day or even to stay with me in the hospital. And I remember this guy, his name's Hoppy. He had had cancer before me. I think it was like a year before me. And he came all the way up and he just spent time with me and he told me what to expect. And he said, if you ever need anything, reach out. I don't care what time of the day it is. If it's night, I don't care. Just reach out to me if you need me. And uh, so I, I had so much support. And I have to say, there's one more thing I have to say. There was this person named Kevin, um, who was probably the biggest angel. I've one of the biggest angels. I've had so, I've, I've had so many blessings in my life and he's one of my blessings. And I didn't really know Kevin very well. I met him at film school. So remember, I've been at film school for maybe two months. And we, I, I went to the movies maybe twice with Kevin because that's what you do at film school. You go to the movies. So we went to the movies a couple times and he heard that I had cancer. And when he heard that I had cancer, he all of a sudden stepped up and he was there for every single treatment I had. He was there for every blood transfusion I had. He actually ended up moving into my, I was living with my aunt at the time. Cause I had just, you know, transitioned from SeaWorld to, to, uh, film school. So she had me stay with her. And so he, she actually asked if he wanted to move in. So he moved into another room and he was there to take me to the hospital. Like at one point I got a fever in the middle of the night and I had to go to the hospital. He drove me down to the hospital with another good friend of mine, um, Brian, who had, you know, had like stayed with me for maybe two months during the time too. So, I mean, it's just crazy the love I had, but this guy stepped up out of nowhere. So I had this boyfriend who just totally dropped out of my life. Um, And then I had this other person who just came out of nowhere and just lifted me up and helped me get through this. And I remember he wrote me something. I was trying to find it. I I made a copy of it, but for some reason it's really blurry, (laughs) but um he wrote me this letter that he gave me after my first chemotherapy treatment. And it said, I can't fight the fight for you, Joy, but I can um, be your coach. And that's pretty much what he did. So he was there with me all the time to to lift me up. So that having those people around me, I think was a huge factor with me getting through it, you know, in a certain way, because I, I didn't sit there and dwell on it. Because I have to say when I was alone, those were the toughest times for me. And, and I needed to be alone. So it's not that I didn't want to be alone. I needed those times to process everything. But when I was around my friends and family, I felt like I had to be a warrior and strong 
because then they could be strong for me. And that's what I needed. So, so having that around me was very, very helpful. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's wonderful. And a lot of the times too, that people, a lot of people that they don't realize sometimes you do need people around you. Um, you need that human connection to have that strength because, you know, and you've seen this with a lot, especially who are sick or just going through anything in life, they tend to isolate themselves they tend to just push everyone away from them because they feel like they just want to deal with it on their own. Yeah. And that's fine. That's how they want to deal with it for, for, and that's their journey for me, my journey. I think it was very helpful for me to have those people there. Yeah. So, so it, it, I'm kind of curious now hearing your journey. So you hear about cancer and you survived, you did an awesome job and things happened the right time. So what's your life after cancer? Are, are, are you cancer free hundred percent now? I, I'm not for sure. Uh, well, knock on wood. Yeah. I, I was cured from that type of cancer, but I had lots of chemotherapy. So another type of cancer could always pop up. Um, so, but yeah, I'm, I'm great right now. And I have two wonderful kids, a five-year-old and seven-year-old, which I, you know, was told at one point I couldn't have any kids and then I had two. So everything's been great. I'm, I'm just really happy uh, with my life right now. So yeah, everything's good. I did a TEDx a, lap there. <laughs> that is such a blessing. Yes. I watched that, um, that film that you did um, with um, the TEDx last year that you did. And I love how you shared your stories because even I was touched with that. And I was touched with watching your documentary that you did um, your journey of, um, going through the treatment with with cancer and just oh my god the thought of you shaving you actually shaved your head right and I was looking at so much hair you know yeah. and how, how did that feel just just doing that uh well you know what I so I don't know if I mentioned it during this podcast but I had I was going to film school right and so film school told me that I couldn't go back to film school because um because they they I I wanted to go to film school and learn and just go to the classes but they wanted me to continue also doing the film shoots and I knew I'd be too weak to do that so I ended up making a documentary on myself so I could still learn you know life throws a roadblock at you what do you do you figure a way around it so that was my way around it and, uh, and so when I went to go shave my head, I knew that that was a moment I need to get from my documentary. Cause I'm also a director <laughs> at this point. Mm -hmm. And so I remember calling up my friend from film school and I asked him if he could film it. And so he came down and then I asked my brother to shave my head cause I had shaved some other people's heads before this. Um, there were a bunch of guys at film school that wanted me to shave their heads just to, so they could show their support. And I'll never forget, I was shaving someone's head and, and the, the clippers made this horrible sound. <laughs> I thought I had like lacerated his head, cut off an ear. I don't know what it was, but I didn't want that to happen to me with someone else shaving my head. So I, I had my brother shave it. And, um, I remember trying to be really positive. So I really tried to smile and I, I want it to be this like GI Jane, Jane moment where mm -hmm. I was super strong shaving my own head or having my brother shave my head. But I got to tell you, the minute I started to see myself without hair, that's when the realization set in that I was a cancer patient because before I had hair and I was, you know, it's just, I was separated. And so that was like my transition, which was then happening on camera and I was being filmed this whole time. And so my lips start to quiver and I start to cry. And, and I'll never forget my brother. I, I said, okay, guys, now you have to make me laugh. And mm -hmm. you could hear the cameraman, my friend Brian, sigh. <sighs> he know what to say. Because what do you say? Oh, my gosh. I don't, right. I don't even know what to say. Yeah. And then my brother, um, he was silent for a little bit. And then he said, so do you want me to leave your sideburns? <laughs> like, <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. I heard that, so yeah. Funny. And it's, it's funny because now that you mentioned that, that actually the moment when you were shaving, and, and I remember I could see the look on your face that you were trying to keep it positive. You I know, was. but you had like, tears was just building up in your eyes but you yeah. had a big smile on your face and I could see that you're about to cry and I'm watching and I'm thinking it's gonna come out she's gonna cry <laughs> she's gonna start bawling it's gonna come out and then I remember hearing that from your brother I actually it started it made me laugh I started cracking up <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> so that was um that was a good one and you know, it's this is such a such a journey. And congratulations, you know, for overcoming this. And you know, there's so much more. I mean, gosh, that you can do. And 
And I love how you're sharing your story um, and then you're open to it because it just opens up a lot more for others also that, you know, especially those who may be going through the same thing that it's, they're, they're not alone. No, and you'd be surprised how much support people will give you uh, if if you let them. So there's going to be people who leave your life, and that's okay. <laughs> and then there's going to be people who come in that you never expected to come in. So, um, so yeah, for me, it was an important part of of what I went through. And it's actually, fine people. sorry, can I? Um, I want to say something that I think is really important is that I had listened to a motivational speaker about two years before I got sick. His name was Zig Ziglar. And there was a story about him being in the airport and his flight being canceled. And, um, and instead of him being upset or angry when he found that out, he said, fantastic. And then he went through all the reasons why it was good that his flight had been canceled. Like, um, he said, well, I figure there's something wrong with that plane. Uh, there's something wrong with the people flying that plane. There's something wrong with the weather that plane will be flying in. If that's the case, I don't want to be up there. I want to be right down here. Fantastic. And when I, that story, I always love. So I'd always retell it to people before I got sick. And then there was this moment where I was just really angry after I was diagnosed. It was before I had any chemotherapy or anything. I I had someone actually leave my life at that point. Um, My boyfriend (laughs) stopped talking to me after he found out that I had cancer, like just stopped, just never spoke to me again. Uh, And I called him from a number that was, um, you know, blocked or whatever. And he hung up on me. And that's when I felt like all this anger and I felt pain in this lump where I'd never experienced pain before. And I was so grateful that I listened to Zig Ziglar because in that moment I knew that I had to change how I thought, right? I couldn't this, okay, this is my life I'm talking about. I can't worry about this putz <laughs> who has, you know, done this. <laughs> um, I, I've got to worry about myself. And I, and that's when I drew on that, that story that Zig had told and how, cause I loved how he was able to turn a negative experience into a positive. And I thought if he can do that with his flight being canceled, then I can do that with cancer. And I started thinking of all of the reasons why it was good that my flight had been canceled. And I, I, so I think that that is a very important part uh, for me is that I had kind of fortified my mind before I went into this without even knowing it, you know, just by listening to these uh, motivational speeches by Zig, because they really resonated with me. So I was able to carry that through and draw on it in times when I needed it the most. Fantastic, right? Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, you know what, right now, my mind's going through, okay, you know what? Because I'm going through some changes myself, um, you know, not to downplay yours. So I, I moved from California to Washington. So it's my first day in Was- Bellingham, Washington. Mm-hmm. And um, pretty much because I was a personal trainer, you know, pretty much 99 to 98% of my clients were in person. Or I do have some virtual and some app-based training. And I can't help but think to myself, oh, man, you know, I'm going to train clients here. I'm a new city. I got to reinvent myself. I think myself now fantastic because that's not what I want anyways. I want to become a professional life coach full time and become a motivational speaker. So this is fantastic. Yeah, I yeah. may feel uncomfortable and may I may not like it, but this is all part of the process. And this is my this is my purpose in life. Now I say I go after it. That's the that's the main thing, you know. Yeah. And so when you talk about that, I can't help but think in my mind, wow, I'm going through all these changes. It's scary. I born and raised in California, so I, I worked at SeaWorld actually one point in my life back in I think, 2000 and yeah, 1999. I was like 16, 17. Oh God, I worked I was in there. The, <laughs> I worked in a place called uh, I worked in a place called uh, Shipwreck. I don't know if they're still even around. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. I worked in the, the galley, so I is I after working there, I couldn't stand food. <laughs> <laughs> because I saw it did, and how food was made. It, it's like my boss is 19 years old. I'm 16. Yeah. Uh, the hours, this, but it's, you know, when you're 16, this kind of jobs you have. Yeah, right. Uh, so I born and raised in California. I only left California to go to Las Vegas for a store management position at a place called Foot Action USA, which is similar like a Foot Action. Foot, foot Action, sorry, which is similar like Foot Locker, which is a shoe place of shoes and clothes. But I think Foot Action went out of business maybe 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. And um, I hated Vegas. It's the first time I ever left California. And as soon as I came back, I'm never leaving California. And right. I left California. Yeah. So I can't help again. It's fantastic. Yes, it's uncomfortable. Yes, I'm just going to make some adjustments. Yes, I'm going to not be able to go on vacations, you know, three or four times a year. I may not be able to buy the best of clothes all the time. But this is all part of what I really, really want. Because when I train my clients, they don't know what I'm thinking, right? Obviously, I'm training them. I'm having a conversation with them. My mind is thinking about all these wonderful things I'd be working on. But I can't because I'm training. 
So now I can take time with these things to get me to my purpose in life. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm a new word. It's fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I say to that is that it, this is just all recently when we've gone through these changes and after going through this training um, with life coaching is that you just follow your heart. Right. Mm-hmm. So what is that? What does your heart tells you? Is that what your heart tells you? Then that's where you stick with that. Because sometimes it's just mind over matters. And, and you know, we all go through this. Your mind tells you something else and your heart tells you something else. Yeah. But, you know, it, it's it's when I go through this all the time. <laughs> I think we all do that. You know, you want to do something really, really bad. But then your mind is telling you, no, you shouldn't. But your heart tells you, yes, you should, because this is what you want. But, right. What really holds you back is what your mind is telling you. And what is the reason why your mind is telling you that, you know, and those things is like, they're just, you'll never know. But, you know, I, yeah, I've recently, I've just had this, this wake up call, I think. And I just realized I'm just going to follow my heart because each time that I follow my heart, I feel fulfilled. I feel satisfied. You know, it's just like, yeah. I'll give a fun example, like having a piece of cake. I love sweets. I love cake. And you know, I was craving cake one night and I said, I'm going to drive to Safeway and just get a piece of cake because I'm too lazy to make something. But my mind tells me, no, you don't need it because it's too, it's already late. It's 10 o'clock at night and whatever. And I said, you know what? No, I really wanted it. So I went and got a piece of cake. I was really happy. (laughs) (laughs) I was super happy taking that bite of cake and I was just sitting there and watching TV and eating. And I remember texting it to my friends and I took a picture of it. It says, look what I'm having right now. Yeah, it's 10 o'clock at night, but guess yeah. what? I'm, guess how I'm feeling though. I'm feeling yeah. happy. I'm going to bed with a smile. So, you know, that's that's what, that's what all it is. And it, it's just, all this kind of just takes practice, right? And, yeah. and Joy, I wanted to go back to um, the film school. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, I wanted, I, I'm curious when, when you said uh, they told you that you couldn't continue and you couldn't go back, what was that like for you? What was the feeling like for you? Because this is something that you wanted to do. Yeah. I think whenever you go off on a different journey in life, you know, you're taking a chance and that's what I was doing. I, like, like I said, I just left something that I was good at. I, you know, I, I, everything was good with what I was doing. I was happy. There was nothing wrong with what I was doing. I just had this other thing that just kept coming up in my my soul and my head, I kept thinking about the editing. And so when I found out that I couldn't continue, um, it just, I, I'll never forget it. When I heard this, I was sitting in the car in front of film school and it was nighttime because it was, you know, November time, you know, it was November. And so it, it gets dark earlier. And so I'm just sitting there and it was just like that quiet you hear, or you can almost like hear your body, the blood pumping mm-hmm. and that's it. Um, and it was just, It's just, I think you have a choice and that's where I I didn't know what I was going to do. And I didn't make the choice to make a documentary then, um, but I knew I wanted to continue learning and I knew I wanted to figure out a way to do this. So I think it was just that resolve to to find something, but it was pretty devastating. (laughs) I bet. You know, I just wanted to learn. I wanted to continue learning. Why would they stop me from learning? But for some reason (laughs) they did. Yeah. But, but I mean, but look at that. I mean, they stopped me from learning and if I, they hadn't done that, I wouldn't have made a documentary. So, I mean, there are these things that happen in our lives and we don't know why it's happening. And then we later on find out that it was a blessing that it happened. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's a challenge, right? Um, I I feel like sometimes situations like that, it's either they're challenging you or they're putting you to test. Like, is this what, I think Ron, you mentioned this to me earlier, that is this really what you wanted to do Um, or, or not? You know, it's they're putting to a test that if this is it, then you go on and you kind of just prove them wrong also at the same time. Yeah, I mentioned earlier to you because um, I really believe this. Um, you, we all have something that we want to do. And obviously, you know, in a perfect world, we wish you would, I'm going to do X and it happens automatically. Right. Like you snap your fingers and it is in front of you. But along the way, there are challenges that are going to happen. And I call these a naysayer. So it could be people that question you or second guess what you're really doing. So you second guess yourself. Or more importantly, there are small little nuggets that show up to challenge you out the blue. Is this what you really want to do? Right? Is, is this really what you want to have? I mean, so many people t- tell me about life coaching that 
what does it mean? I, I don't quite understand it or it doesn't make sense. And what's this belief system? And, and what do you mean by perceptions? And it, but it, it keeps telling me I'm doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. I, I never forget this. When I first started my first email campaign, um, and I started talking about, you know, objectivity versus subjectivity, just simple things like that, um, which sounds simple, but you put in more context as far as reality in real life, people don't know what is really subjective or objective. So I had a couple of clients I actually knew and trained, and they pretty much um, unsubscribed from my email address or unsubscribed from my email campaign. I was like, dog, man, I'm not going to do this anymore. Mm-hmm. So I stopped doing it. And for me, I had never been a really good writer. So I'm not the per- first person to write an essay. That will not be me. Uh, but it will be me now because first thing is that because I didn't really do well in English or well in, in grammar or well in processing all that stuff, I just avoided it. So when it subscribed, unscribed my email address, it said, well, I'm doing the wrong thing. Second being, it, I mean, I wrote the wrong kind of context, so I didn't like it. And when I hired a coach, he gave me a new perspective. He says, well, that's going to happen. Some people may not want the email. Doesn't mean you did the wrong thing. They still don't want to see the email. And there's nothing wrong with that. So I'm like, wow, you know what? Everything we're doing in life is there to challenge us. It's up to us to either step forward. Mm-hmm. I tell my clients like the invisible wall is either for us to step forward or step back. But there is, there is something there and there is a solution to it. If you really believe and convince by what you're doing, whatever it is, you can step through the invisible wall. Because the invisible wall is only what your mind says. Oh, this, so all that thing I was talking about, about email, it wasn't people were saying it to me. It's all the construction of my mind saying to myself, well, it's because this, 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 making all these reasons. But when I hired a coach and kind of got over that and stepped through that invisible wall, I was able to say, wait a minute here. It's not that bad at all. Then subscribe. Fantastic. Like you say now. And, and now I realize, wait a minute, I'm going to keep doing what I want to do because one day it's going to hit and it'll keep hitting and hitting, hitting. But I had to be convinced and what I'm doing is on the right path for myself. Yeah. And you got to focus on the good. I mean, I, like I all, um, I, I'm the same way. It, it would like bother me if I got a negative comment or whatever, but it's like, okay, but there's all of these people who are giving me positive feedback. So why are you going to focus on the one person that's being negative or, or honestly, like if they unsubscribe to your thing, that's great because then that wasn't your customer anyway. That wasn't someone that you're affecting anyway. So let's hone down your base of people that you are helping. So, I mean, so fantastic. <laughs> yep, here's what same I, thing. Here's what I, I always tell myself when I run into that situation of any negativity from anybody else is that I kind of take a, a step back a little bit from that. But yes, we can't help but kind of question ourselves sometimes or second guess ourselves sometimes when they say something negative about what you're doing. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. And so you kind of take a step back. What I tell myself what comes up to me and I remind myself is that I must be doing something right Uh because they wouldn't notice it and they wouldn't recognize it if I wasn't doing anything right. Right. You know what? um, The the Tony Robbins, I I really never listened to him that much before, but recently I listened to uh, him a bunch and there was something that he said that I really liked and it, cause I do the same thing. So like, don't sit here and think that I don't do this. I do the same thing. I'm like, Oh, and I, I focus on this stuff sometimes. But one thing he pointed out was you, you, could, you should squash those thoughts in the very beginning become, before they become giants and monsters, you know, before they're so big that they take over your life. But you squ- if you squash it in the beginning, those like focusing on those negative things or like, you know, then, then they just go away. So I have actively made a point because I would do this, I would like focus on that before I have, I've actually made a point to like, like acknowledge it and then just let go of it. And I think that that is so important to not let it grow because the times when I, I can see that in my life before where I focused on something that was a little bit negative and it wasn't that big of a deal. And then I've made it into something really big because I focus on it too much. So I think that that's an important thing to do is just to, you know, acknowledge it and let go of it as soon as you can. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and so now with film school, were you able to continue film school and prove that school wrong that I could still do it? No, they said no. That was it. So I, that was it for that film school. But you know what's great, which I don't ever talk about, is so I went through my chemotherapy. Um, so I, I don't know when I finished. I finished maybe April or May or so. And then I, was, I, I always had my eye on AFI, the American Film Institute, which is I think actually right now the top film school in the country. I'm not sure where it ranks in the world, but it's, it's a top film school. 
And so I always had my eye on that and I ended up applying for it. And I thought it was just a class. So this is where it gets a little bit weird. I, I thought it was just like one class I'm producing. Well, it turns out it was like the whole producing track. And once you're in a track, you're like in that track for the whole year. And so um, I I got really lucky and they saw my, my reel and my application and I got accepted to the American Film Institute. So then for the following year, I actually went to the American Film Institute and I, I helped produce a bunch of short films and learned a lot about filmmaking. Um, and then the second year, what you do is you produce someone else's film. And so I actually didn't go back the second year because I figure, why am I going to put all this time and energy into someone else's film when I can just do that to my own film? So I just spent the rest of my time actually producing my documentary. Um, so anyway, I, so I never went back to Brooks Institute, but I did go to American Film Institute, which is a 1000 times better school <laughs> than, mm -hmm. than the first one that I had gone to. So, I mean, I, I did get validated in that, which was really nice. Okay. Awesome. Look at that. Everything's yeah. happening for you because you want things to happen for yourself. Yeah. And in your last statement about um, um, Jim, oh, not Jim, Tony Robinson, as I read one of my books, um, I read a lot of conscious books. It's by David R. Hawkins, and it's called Eye of the Eye from Which No Pathway is Hidden. Mm -hmm. And it talks about how what we, what we hold in mind tend to manifest. So if you're holding something in your mind that's yeah. obviously if it's helping you, obviously if it's serving you great, but if it's not serving you in any way, but it's something that's negative, not serving you, it will tend to manifest and it'll just keep growing and growing like a monster. It keeps, it's like almost like snowball effect. A snowball rolls downhill very small before you know it's this monster or snowball that just mows you down. So, and think about what you said now, I'm really going to be really um, prolific about showing what manifests my mind. Cause I don't want to tend to keep getting bigger and bigger over and over. Right. So as, um, I, I want to know this as we get to the end of our podcast. Um, what was something, you know, through your journey and all of your experience, you know, these years, what is something you would say to our listeners that may be going through something? Maybe not something like you went through cancer and your life and boyfriend and people. What, what are people going through something? What would you say for them? How would they change and manifest it better for themselves? Okay. Well, I don't know exactly what to say, but I'll give it a try. My experience in life has been that there are ups and downs. It's it's a broken road that we go through, right? There's there's things that we don't understand that happen to us, and it's not where we want to be. And I remember my stepmom would tell me, "You're exactly where you're supposed to be," and I was like, oh, "Come on, <laughs> that, can't be, that can't be true." Because um, I went through some hard times after cancer, but uh, but it really was it's that road that you need to travel. And if you just keep your eye on the goal that you have and you take steps towards it every day, you really need to do this every day. You're gonna get there to that goal. But I think it's having that vision and that goal of what you want and where you want to be that is so important to actually getting there. Because we can all like, oh, I want to, you know, live in a nice house and whatever. Well, well, that's not, I mean, you need to have steps of how to get there and you need to have something bigger really to, to get there. So I think it's just making uh, goals and then breaking it up into smaller steps and then acting on those every day. And it, you will be surprised how much momentum you get behind you. I'm going to, I'm crazy about Zig. So I'm going to keep going back to Zig, but he had this metaphor of a water pump. So I don't know a whole lot about water pumps, but apparently <laughs> it, um, you have to pump it a bunch to get any water coming up. And so if you stop, then that, that water goes all the way back down and you need to start again. So you really need to get that momentum behind you of working it day in and day out towards your goal, ma making sure you have that vision of where you want to go and breaking it down. And if you continue to do it, you're going to get there. And you may not see results at first because most of that energy goes into the beginning stages when you're trying to get there. So I'd say just like keep going, keep going, keep going, and you will see results eventually towards your goal. So just don't give up. And, you know, people are going to have roadblocks and speed bumps in their life. And it doesn't matter what it is. You just need to find a way to get around it and know that there is a way to get around it. You know what you said in better words than I can say, but that was my point. Yeah. Uh, how, how, uh, yeah. How, how to, you know, we hit a lot of roadblocks in life or speed bumps or potholes, whatever it may be. And we just get stuck. We just can't get out of it. And mm -hmm. we can stay there for months, we stay there for years, we stay there for a lifetime. And it goes back to uh, my mom. My mom um, could have been a wonderful, beautiful model, but she got consumed with finding love. 
it doesn't mean I, I'm not saying finding love is wrong or connecting with people or don't want to be alone. It's nothing wrong with that. But as she's now 70, she wish she made better decisions in her life, but she spent at least a good 25 years that I can remember trying to find love. Now, I heard my parents, hurt my mom and my dad divorced a long time ago when in their 30s. My mom spent from like 36 to now she's single and alone or by herself, let's say, trying to find love. And she really regrets a lot of decisions she's made in her life because she could have lived a better life as she would just say, hey, you know what? Let me focus on myself. And when love is when it's right for me and my time is right, love will come in my life. But she's focused so hard on it, trying to make these relationships work that didn't work, but still trying to make it work. So a person cheats on you 10 times, go back to 11 times, it may work out. And it just went, took her life all the way to the right side, and she couldn't come back to the left or to the middle. And she has a lot of regret around that. And you know what? Nobody's perfect. You know? Yes. Um, we're all... How should I say? Well, I think I said this one time. We're like perfectly imperfect. And oh, I've heard you say that on another podcast. And I love that. That's yeah. one of the things I say too. Yes. Okay, go on. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, no, no, that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. I don't remember where it was. I, I can't remember where I saw that, but I just remember seeing it. I was like, oh my God, that makes so much sense because mm -hmm. here we are trying to be perfect, right? I mean, I think we all grew up. I, we, we, I grew up in a, in a broken home, you know, I, my father wasn't around, but we try to be this somebody or this perfect person growing up and being somebody until we just kind of get tired of it. But we try to keep going. Anyways, uh, what I'm trying to say is that nobody's perfect. You know, we like with, with Ron, you, you know, your mom, you're seeing that, but for her, maybe for her at that time, that's who she wanted to be. And that's what she wanted in life. You know, and, and to these days, maybe she didn't see anything wrong with that. But in your eyes, maybe, you know, it's something that you wish she could, you know, you know, she could have done better. But again, nobody's perfect. You know. And, and, and the book you're quoting is Embracing Certainty. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it. And, yes. And I, I read that book, too. So, you know, like like with joy as, as an inspiring and motivational speaker as you are. Um, and I love, I love watching your videos. You know, it was very inspiring, very motivating. And I think that I resonated a lot with, you know, what, what you've gone through because then I see all of us here, even with Ron and the changes that we're going through, we want to be this, this change in the world, you know, for me, I wanted to first start off with touching the youth nowadays because they're just going through so much. And I just wanted to tell them, gosh, listen, there's so much more in life than what you think it is. You know, you, nobody's yeah. perfect. And to them, it's always like being trying to be perfect because of social media and trying to fit in, but you're just perfectly imperfect. And I have to try to make them understand what that really means, right? Because social media sometimes just kind of breaks them. And oh, I know. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's bad because they feel like they have to fit in. No, you could be your true authentic self. You may have 10 who doesn't like you, but you'll have 100 others who will love you for who you are. Yeah. Um, and so, Joy, where can our listeners find you and follow you? Oh, well, I'm on LinkedIn and that's where I post mainly is on LinkedIn. So if you look up Joy Clausen Soto, you can find me there. And I also have a website, which is joyclausensoto.com. Um, and it's C-L-A-U-S-E-N-S-O-T-O -E for my last name. Joy is pretty self-explanatory. So <laughs> joyclausensoto.com. And, <laughs> and I like that because it's, it's you. You bring so much joy into the world. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, Joy, I really, really appreciate hearing your story and knowing that uh, there's hope out there and we all have the power inside us to really achieve anything we desire or anything we want to. And the happiness really comes from helping others. You got more happiness with working with the kiddos and going to SeaWorld and it's so gratifying. So, and when the doctor said you couldn't have kids, you have two wonderful kids and you're married. Life is great. So it really boils down to... Uh, how you handle things and, and how you react to certain situations. Most time we react rather than processing it first, then come up with a best solution for ourselves. So 
Thanks again, Joy, for listening to another uh, episode of Life's a Shuffle. It's great having you. I hope we have you again. And keep going and whatever you're doing, you're impacting the world. You're impacting us right now in this podcast. And what's great about this is that when you share your story to the world, the world fan, the, the um, word fantastic will go with me forever. So now you're part of my life forever. Yes. So thank I love you again. That. Thank you. <laughs> thanks again, Joy. Um, thanks for um joining us today and sharing your story to our listener and to us. Um, we really enjoyed it and loved hearing your stories. Not only like I I can't stress enough about going back to your videos because I think it's very, very motivational. I think everyone should check it out and and just look at it and just watch it. It um, is very inspiring. Um, again, thanks, Joy, um, for joining us today. And to our listeners, thank you to um, listening and tuning into another episode of Life's a Shuffle.